But my name is Heather Harris, and I am the Educational Programs Manager here at the Art Museum of West Virginia University. And we do the monthly lunchtime looks talk to get a chance to see works of art in our gallery in a different way. And it is my pleasure to have today Renee Nicholson, who is the director of the WVU Humanities Center. She is an associate professor in the programs of multi and interdisciplinary studies. And her most recent book is Fierce and Delicate, Essays on Dance and Illness. So thank you so much for being here today, Renee, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. <clears throat> so uh, in order to um, appear completely spontaneous and very natural, I have written out all of my remarks ahead of time. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Art Museum of WVU for having me today, um, and also for the time and the care that they put into all of their exhibits and events. And uh, musing today on place, having such a place on campus like this is truly a blessing. And today, in hoping to forge some connections between art and writing through place, I hope we might also celebrate this space that we're in together, whether here uh, in person or virtually. For it's an amazing uh, potential to transport us from our everyday lives into moments of creativity, beauty, and ideas. And as I'm here, I can't help but question, what does it mean to evoke a sense of place? And why has place played such a central role in our understanding of both art and literature? How do artists harness the energy of place and transfer that energy to us through their making? These are big questions that I'm not sure in the time that we have today that I'll answer, but I hope to effectively complicate how you might consider the answers to them. Place captures our imagination because it plays a vital role in story. And story is often how we understand the world and make meaning. When we encounter a piece of writing or a work of art, our minds often move towards the understanding through the question, what is this all about? We construct meaning when we allow our imaginative powers to work on us. And of these, one of the most potent is that of story. And in terms of story creation, place allows us to recreate the scene and the ex and experience in the mind of a reader or as a viewer. It can act as a backdrop or provide context. And I'd argue it's part of the meaning making of the story itself. So I write mostly creative nonfiction and poetry. And in creative nonfiction, such as this year's Campus Read, The Line Becomes a River by Francisco Cantu, the place and location where the experience take place is more than just the name, the border. This location has a physical attributes that allow us to understand the place in visceral ways. Francisco Cantu brings the desert lands of the Southwest Western United States and Mexico in a way that evokes a spareness and openness to unexpected beauty and an almost unrepentant harshness. It mirrors the plight of undocumented illegal migrants and it informs who he is as a border agent and later as a writer looking back on this past self. So he writes, Cold air blew in from outside and I gazed beyond the road at the dust devils creeping across the warmly lit valley, a myriad of clay colored cones whirling in the distance. For a short time driving down the open road, I felt a strange and familiar sense of freedom an old closeness with the desert. Perhaps there was something comforting, I thought, about being able to look out across the landscape and see for myself the horrors laid upon it. I looked again through the mesh to the woman seated behind me. She stared out the open window, her hair whipping at her sun-wrinkled face. I wondered what she might have seen, what she might feel looking out at the desert, and I was certain it was no sense of freedom. 
We can admire the way in which the plight of the border crossers is mirrored in the way Cantu renders his landscape, creating a sense of place inextricable from the people dep depicted within it, including himself. The term dust devils evokes ominous things as he describes the chaos of his work. And one can't help but conflate those myriad clay colored cones whirling in the distance with a sense of dread. Cantu will leave this work, but in depicting how he came to this decision, he uses the desert itself to create that sense of foreboding. Yet he also embraces the vastness of the, the desert to save him and giving him a sense of freedom. And then wonders if this could be akin to what the detained woman he transports could also be thinking. He cannot know, but he can see the desert also in her sun wrinkled face and understands that her connection to this landscape can be much different from his own. And this way place is complex. It's complicating meaning. In writing, and especially in memoir, place often has significant meaning as we see in this Cantu work. Place becomes an important aspect on how we shape our perception. So I'm gonna take one more example from Cantu. As I cut for sign along the border road, I watched a Sonoran coach whip snake try to find its way into Mexico through the pedestrian fence. The animal slithered along the length of the mesh, looking for a way south, hitting its head against the rusted metal gate again and again, until finally I guided it over the wide opening of a wash gate. After the snake had made its way across the adjacent road, I stood for a while looking through the mesh, staring at the undulating track left in the dirt. Cantu's elastic lyrical prose gives shape to a landscape that affects him as the narrator. I sense he is feeling his own way through the story, even as he spins it. The reflective measured version of him that tells the story feels present in the landscape he presents, the man-made fence and the undulating tracks of the snake. While his boots walk this patch of sandy desert terrain, he cannot help but take in how the natural earth along a man-made barrier mars the natural habitat. Through his words, we are transported to this place, one of that showcases conflicted feelings and the complex situation of the border itself. So here's a full confession, full confession. As both a reader and probably also as a writer, I am attracted to harsh places for their innate sense of tension and story. I find meaning in story by taking in each word, by sitting closely and attentively with the text. And I think I look for this when I take a look at art. As a non-visual artist, I come to art simply as a viewer, not as a critic, not an art historian, definitely not as a visual artist. As a creative writer, art to me is a masterclass in how to see, on how to slow down and to take in what's in front of me, to process the emotional experience and to respect that dyad of me in silent conversation with a work. That's how I first came to understand William H. Partridge's Winter Light, which is this picture here. It's also only fair to tell you, I delight in winter. I feel energy in the cold snap it creates in my lungs and how it tingles my skin. I appreciate winter's darkness, the way it allows for burrowing and deep contemplation. And these feelings rise to the surface when I take in winter twilight. The deep evergreen against the stark barrenness of other trees gives rise to the tension of different ways of enduring, enduring the severe conditions of the season. Winter pairs us down to essentials, not so unlike the unwavering conditions of Cantu's deserts. 
However, in Partridge's landscape, we see the interplay of two different kinds of light, the cool white snow and the warmer orange of the setting sunlight, straining to glow between the boughs of deep green, light that feels in some far off distance within sight and yet just beyond grasp. There's a spareness in this landscape, that of receding warmth, and my mind sets to wonder about what this viewing can teach me about how nature embodies larger forces. If winter teaches us that outer cold seduces our inner warmth, we might consider the small cloister of warm orange light at the center of this piece and the way it mirrors to our own experience of winter. In places, more diffuse yellow peeks out from the branches, the struggle of lightness and dark, of warmth and cold depicted in these brushstrokes. Tension too seems, to, seems part of the snow itself. It's light color antithetical to the heaviness it portrays. And it's no wonder we often use the word blanket to portray how snow has fallen and settled on the earth. In this way, winter twilight helps me parse the way we use language to describe and understand the natural world. To blanket can be both to swaddle and to smother. And, we can, and can't we feel that tension uh, between these in the picture itself, a picture both pastoral and embracing a natural austerity that if not exactly menacing, then vaguely inhospitable. Yet I feel invited into this space, embracing a serenity suggested by the quiet of the coming eventide to a place without people in it to mar the silence. When I come to place as a writer, it can be both setting and character. And as I take in winter twilight, that sense of setting and character twine pervades my understanding of it. While I have not been in this exact location of Partridge's setting, I can use my training as a writer, possibly making it possible for me to experience this space beyond even my memory into that deep wellspring of imagination. I've walked in snowy woods before, in the soft light of early morning or the slow recede of light nearing dusk. And it's the act of my mind forging these connections with what I'm seeing in the painting that's working on me as an imaginative creature. And so I would postulate it can also with any of you. What I might suggest is that we are all imaginative creatures and whether or not we've spent much time with creative writing, it's through our sense of place, a place that every human being probably has that's close and important to them, that we can ignite the power of imagination within ourselves. As I have learned over many years of writing, places themselves and depiction of them in words and image can have a shadowing effect on our own consciousness. So that when we allow ourselves to write after reading or viewing art, we write in the shadow of these texts. And that on some inexorable level, they work on us, informing our responses in ways that shape meaning. And I would ask, if you felt unafraid to write about this picture, what might appear in your mind's eye and be transposed onto the page? Let me return a minute to the line becomes a river. In Cantu, his final complex view of the border itself is reimagined through the Rio Grande River. He writes, as I swam toward a bend in the canyon, the river became increasingly shallow. In a patch of sunlight, two long-nosed gars 
relics of the Paleozoic era hovered in the silted waters. I stood to walk along the adjacent shorelines, crossing the river time and again as each bank came to an end until finally, for one brief moment, I forgot in which country I stood. All around me, the landscape trembled and breathed as one. Can to resist easy summations of what the border is and instead literally submerges us into the natural barrier using the fluidity of water to better convey his sense of what the border could be. Though it is not winter here yet. The moment of winter twilight ushers me into a season I both relish and don't quite understand my attachment to. But I'm feeling that sense of winter so much that I am put in, in mind of a poem I wrote before to try to explain that feeling of winter, of embracing that quiet darkness, cold and contemplative state. And one that I'd like to share with you now to be in conversation with Partridge. This is winter solstice. I was born the darkest night of the year. Mom says, Every day after me was filled with more light. But mom, what if I prefer the dark? In the light, these eyes sometimes deceive me. Lack of sight, a kind of vision. Better to trust my fast beating heart. Winters in West Virginia run unpredictable. 70 degrees during Valentine's Day and snow in April just like the Prince song. How do we lose our way? The tall pine shudder, a howling wind echoes through the frost like a lost friend. My bones prefer the chill of winter to summer's heat and my face tingling from cold, great puffs I might swallow back whole. There is something about winter that clarifies my sense of seeing, that crystalline quality that attends the cold, perhaps the thing that pulls me towards it. Partridge captures it so effectively that by just viewing his painting carefully and patiently, I am able to access those things about the season that unlock my potential for place and story making. What sparks endure as the world is frozen? Right? Sparks there that endure as the world is frozen. For me, this is imagination distilled. The white blanketing of the earth is canvas, perhaps in some small way, sim a similar impetus as the desert and the river are for Cantu. These places allow us to dig deep into our experience, not just for story, but for lyric possibilities. The right depiction in art pulls us out of these sensibilities, these things that live and exist in me as a writer, as a person. And in this way, the potential of place is layered, unpredictable, and therefore quite hard to pin down. And yet artists across forms and genres, harness this sense of place and pull us in, giving us footing, both literal and metaphorical, as a way of seeing, and I would also argue as a way of being in the world. Art has its own language, and for me, not all of it is in the familiar tongue. But sense of place helps me to bridge that gap. And the specific rendering gives me a worldview to explore and parse, to engage with collaboratively and imaginatively. And most of all, it unlocks the potential for wonder. And can't we all do with a little more wonder? We can understand place in both writing and art as inviting us in 
to a kind of spirit, contact with a unique identity and energy, and perhaps even a kind of soul. When we come to understand place through our interactions with art and writing, we access an inexhaustible, inexhaustible source of creative power. And this is our charge. In this way, we are all explorers. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we're going to have a few moments with, uh, for Q&A. For those of you who are here in the live audience, I will be repeating your questions into the microphone so that they can be audible to the folks that are um, joining us online. I already see a few people online doing this, but um, for you all, if you put your questions in the Q&A part of Zoom rather than the chat function, that will help me to keep track of them all. Um, and as I said, I already have um, a couple questions in the Q&A. So I'll start with the virtual world. And if anyone here has something they'd like to ask Renee. So Tia would like to know, do you have your students review art and write poem stories of their perception of what they see or feel? Oh, what a great question. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, yes. Um, I love using uh, art in the classroom. Um, I use it with creative writers, but I often teach creative writing to people completely outside. And I find that art is a way to bring people in. And particularly, I use this in a class that I've taught uh, several times and hope to teach again called Medicine and the Arts. And when, you know, pre-med students, pre-health students and other students are sitting in a room and really taking in a picture and really trying to parse out what the story is, right? They're developing a way of seeing that they can then bring into a clinical encounter. And to me, this is really, really exciting, right? Because, you know, humanities, art, medical science, all converging in one place. But I think that you know, if you're working in one artistic medium, interacting with other artistic mediums is a fantastic way to unlock your creativity and really just being in conversation with artists um, of all ilks can, can really just be liberating. So that's a fantastic question. <laughs> well, it was a fantastic answer because I think I actually had been in my mind uh, posing a question about what is the value of interdisciplinarity, especially in a university setting where we so often identify ourselves by discipline? Right. I'm an art historian, I'm a biologist, I'm an engineer. Um, and I think in some ways that question is a bit redundant now because you answered <laughs> it so beautifully there. But I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to say as, as the director of the humanity centers sure. and a professor of, um, of interdisciplinary studies. Yes, and, and I think the way that you understand the discipline that you're in can be enhanced and enriched by understanding it from another point of view, right? And if we think about it, every profession has a language, usually some sort of special, specialized language. Every profession has a history. It came from somewhere, right? I was having a conversation um, with some science educators and they were reminding me that science has come out of natural philosophy, mm -hmm. right? So um, a good thing for us is to all remember on, on both sides of that equation, right? And all disciplines, right, all areas have cultures or subcultures. And so when we learn to parse those in say humanities or arts classes, right? Even if our discipline is outside of that, we learn how to manage that within our own disciplines. So I, I'm a big fan <laughs> of interdisciplinarity, as you can probably tell, um, but I think it can be intensely useful. Yeah. No, me too. And that's why I'm, we're so thrilled to have you here today. <laughs> um, we have an, an online, someone has asked about, can you say more about writing in the shadow of texts and how those texts work on us as we wonder and make meaning and employ imagination. Oh, another great question. <laughs> I don't know who's in the virtual audience today, but thanks guys. Um, you know, right, anytime we're exposed to other art forms, right, we, they are working on us in some way. And I like this idea of shadow, right? 
I was thinking about this this summer as being someone who admittedly loves winter, being in the shade of a tree in summer is one of those things I delight in, right? And the way that that canopy, it doesn't obscure who we are, right? But it changes us gradually, right? And I'm thinking about the visual artists that I, I have um, worked with and know over the years and the way that light interplays there, right? It subtly changes how we see things, right? So when we read texts, right? We, I'm reading Cantu. Cantu like is writing about a place I don't even know. He's had an experience I'll never have, right? And yet I start thinking about things later, right? A day later, a week later, a month later, right? That are somehow trickling out into my writing, <laughs> right? that I couldn't even imagine happening. And that's, I think, why almost every writer uh, of note that I know has always said, read, 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 read. The only thing I'd add to that is read, 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 go to museums, <laughs> take in all the arts, right? Um, but I, I think that those things are subtle. Um, I'd love to talk to a neurologist about this. Yeah. Like, what are the synapses that happen <laughs> when you're reading or taking in and uh, viewing art um, or listening to music, you know, it, you know to really be kind of full about the range? How is that affecting you? And, you know, what part of the brain is it lighting up? Right, that would be just fantastic to learn more right. about. And this was actually quite a complex question. It was a, a two-parter and you kind of anticipated the second part <laughs> because they also wanted to know, you know, you talk about purposefully writing in conversation with art, um, but do the shadows work subconsciously or unintentionally on us as well? And you were starting to speak <laughs> to that about the areas of the brain that maybe we don't consciously have access to or things that we um, return to days or weeks or months that we might not even make that association that that was the inspiration. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the subconscious mind is so fascinating. And I think that when we just are quiet and still, we allow it to do what it does best, right? Which is to influence us in these very cool, um, very creative ways. Very cool. Um, I have one more question on, online, but I didn't know if there was any question from the live audience I should attend to. I don't want to forget about the folks that are, that are here with us. <laughs> All right. Well, in that case, I'll ask Dominique's question. How do you think your previous career as a ballet dancer, which ah, I did not put in your bio, so someone right. has the insider information, <laughs> yes. uh, informs the way that you look at visual art forms? That's a great question. Um, and yes, I, I was uh, trained as a, in, and spent some time as a dancer. And so let's go back to interdisciplinarity for a moment because a dance performance is such a great example of interdisciplinarity at play, right? We think about the dancers that are depicting something on the stage, right? But there are costume artists, right? That uh, give you cues as well as the dancers and the, and the choreography, choreography itself, right? And you have backdrops often very intricately um, constructed. Again, I would, I would consider you know, those folks artists in their own right. You have musicians, right? And if you're really lucky, you have live musicians. Um, so you have this interplay, you have lighting folks, you have all sorts of different people that must come together, right, to give you this tableau. Um, I think that being a dancer kind of opened me up to other art forms, first and foremost. And so I could appreciate, you know, things that I saw, even if I didn't have a ton of knowledge, I had enough knowledge as a dancer from working with those other kinds of artists that I could be a ton of, right, and understand you know, the work, the effort, the inspiration, the creativity that goes into a different kind of art form. But also it was my job to create shapes and pictures on stage, right? So um, I think I can have an appreciation when I look at a piece of art, right? For almost the choreography of it, right? And I don't know if visual artists think this way, 
Um, so I, I definitely am not speaking for them. But when I see like partridges and I see how the different branches and what kind of branches, it seems to my eye very artfully constructed, right? That there is meaning in why this bow leans this way and kind of cuts that like swath of light there in the center, right? That that has to be intentional or at least it feels intensely intentional to, to my viewing. Right? How do we arrange the scene, either with live bodies or with paint or with words, so that the meaning almost feels as if it had always been that way? Right? I think that's what we're really going for. So I love that question. <laughs> um, I feel like now I should have confession number four. I don't know how many <laughs> confessions I had in this, but yes, I was once a dancer. So uh, that was fun as well. Wonderful. Well, that's all that I have right now virtually. Anything else from the live audience? Yes, Bob. And I'm going to repeat that into the microphone for the outside audience. So uh, Bob Bridges is our curator um, and is always thinking about selections of art. So he wanted to know um, from Renee's perspective, after I invited her in and invited her to give this talk, what drew her to the partridge? What was the selection process of everything that is here in this gallery now, our exhibition, uh, Trees on the Mountain, uh, Trees on the Mountain, Landscape to Appalachia and Beyond. Yes. What, what drew you to the partridge? Um, I would have to say the very first thing was that glowing light <laughs> in the center. <laughs> I mean, as much as I love the winter, and I, I do, right? Uh, I mean, I have a pair of boots that are raining to mar up that snow, right? I want to get out there in it. Um, that white, it's, it's almost like that out of reach, you know, that thing that you see that's just beyond your grasp. I think that's what really drew me to it. And honestly, there were many, many other, um, you know, paintings here that uh, got my attention. Um, I mean, you could have a whole series of talks just on each one of these, <laughs> probably with a different writer and, and get completely different ideas about it. But this one, you know, why does something speak to us is a really interesting question, right? And, and there's a magic, there's a certain amount of magic that like says, I don't want to really get into that. But then of course the other part, the writer part of my brain is you totally want to get into that. Um, I also think, um, you know, it is pastoral, <laughs> but deceptively so, <laughs> you know, when you, when you start looking at it, it, it's kind of like Hemingway sentences, right? They're so simple that 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 true like next level meaning is sometimes obscured, right? Or the way that like a really good line break in poetry forces you to stop and pause. Like you can't even help yourself, right? And so when I look at this, I'm like, I'm drawn to it. Now, why am I drawn to it? Uh, and you know, there's even in, in this is why, uh, I feel like saying a uh, home audience, come in and see this because <laughs> in the snow, you can see little flecks that, you, that, that look like the soil, the earth that, that's around it, right? There's all these little ways that it's perfectly imperfect, right? The way that nature is and, and uh, draws us in. I also, you know, love being out in the woods. Um, it's a place for me that I think is, is just, full of calm, full of possibility. And it allows me to kind of uh, let my thoughts sort themselves instead of me kind of, you know, I'm thinking of my calendar now, putting them into like <laughs> one little part of the grid of my calendar, right? This, this kind of obliterates that and lets them sort itself. So it probably spoke to me on that level too. And I think making the connection to the country, the, the yes. read and 
you talked about something being just out of reach and this idea of the, the border kind of as the shifting fluid place that it ultimately becomes by the end of that book. I think Absolutely. it has a really nice connection there as well as we were trying to think about this program and how we could integrate all of these different things, you know, uh, Renee's background as a writer, but also the campus read as a text and the beautiful exhibition that Bob has curated. And I thank you so much for bringing all of those things together so poetically, so beautifully. And I think it, it um, certainly made me see this piece and this exhibition and with new eyes. I would agree and second your response that those of you at home, if you can make it in to see it in person, um, it will really uh, augment your understanding of, of what exactly Renee has been talking about here today. And thank you to those of you who are here in person. You can feel free to walk around the gallery and uh, enjoy. And we hope that you all join us and tune in. Our next iteration of Lunchtime Lifts will be the first Friday in November. And our speaker then will be Sam Hensley, who is a undergraduate student here. And he was a intern for us this summer. And we're so excited to kind of get the student perspective. One of the things we try to do in Lunchtime Looks is bring an interdisciplinary perspective. And while Sam is an art historian, he brings kind of a generational perspective that is different from a lot of our speakers. So I think it'll be really exciting to hear him uh, reflect on the Rauschenberg exhibition that we have upstairs through the lens of his work here this summer. So thank you to everyone. Thank you again to Renee. Thank you, Jason, who's on the production team at the College of Creative Arts, who's made us all audible for those of you at home. It's, it's a Herculean task to do that. And it's beyond my scope. So thank you very much, Jason. And everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us. Okay.